Welcome to Peace Matters, a podcast about contemporary conflicts in Europe and the world, and how to solve them. Hosted by the International Institute for Peace and Ponto, two Vienna-based think tanks, we discuss the most pressing global challenges with policymakers, military analysts, diplomats, and other stakeholders. In this episode, we are discussing the most significant conflict in Europe that is happening nowadays, the war in Ukraine. And for this discussion, I'm joined by two excellent experts. Hannes Svoboda is the president of the International Institute for Peace and a member of the European Parliament formerly. And Colonel Markus Reisner is a military expert and a historian. In this episode, we are discussing the past 12 months of the war, and how they have changed Ukraine, Russia, and the world. We are also speaking about the ongoing Russian military offensive in the east of Ukraine, as well as why the West should continue supporting Ukraine militarily, while at the same time looking for a diplomatic solution. Tune in! I hope you find this discussion useful. So, we are sitting here in Vienna on February 13th, almost a year after the Russian invasion in Ukraine began uh, on tw February 24th, 2022. And I would like to ask you directly, Marcos, uh, where are we at militarily? What has happened during these past 12 months? If you can give like a very short overview, uh, Russia has invaded. It didn't manage to achieve a blitzkrieg as it had hoped for, but it also didn't withdraw. So where are we at? And maybe uh, an additional short question afterwards. Uh, now we're speaking a lot about the um, upcoming Russian uh, Russian offensive. Uh, possible, possible one, though. No. Possible one, yeah. Some claim it has already started. Yes, but that's I'm one of these. <laughs> yeah, you see? So uh, so that's the second question. What are the goals of this uh, offensive? Okay. Well, uh, so let us start first with uh, the conflict itself, uh, who, which started on the 24th of February last year. So actually we can uh, divide all these nearly 12 months in different phases. The first phase was a surprising one for a lot of um, experts, especially because no one was expecting that when Russia actually is really uh, invading uh, Ukraine, that uh, they will uh, have these kind of difficulties with the Ukrainian side. But it was a, a mixture between uh, several things uh, which the Ukrainians applied. It was first um, the tactics they used, which was very clever done by the Ukrainians. They prepared for this actually for eight years. They always said that the Russians will come. We were not believing, but they were right, um, as we have seen on the 21st of February. It was, of course, the um, assistance with intelligence from uh, the Western states, especially the US and the NATO. And it was, of course, uh, the weapon deliveries, which started quite soon. So this first phase lasted for about two months. At the end of these two months, it was clear for Russia that they will not achieve uh, the victory they have sought for. So they switched, actually. What did they do? They actually tried to come up with a main effort, and that was the Donbass. So they transferred their troops from the Kiev area to the east, and they tried there again to attack the Donbass region. Why the Donbass region? Because about 40% of the Ukrainian armed forces were stationed there, in the Donbass region. Uh, they had some success in summer last year. As you might uh, remember, the uh, cauldron battle for Lysyshansk and Severodonetsk. And the question was, uh, will Ukraine actually manage, after this surprising success in the beginning, to um, fight this starting war of attrition? And this is the, the key point of the second phase. It was already uh, obviously the case that the Russians tried to come up with a solution for their tactical mistakes. And that was um, the way they actually tried to change the fighting in the way that it was a war of attrition. So this went on uh, over the summer. And during that summer, a very important thing was happening because the West started to supply Ukrainian side with especially heavy weapons and with some sophisticated weapon systems, like, for example, the HIMARS rocket launcher. And the HIMARS rocket launchers were able to give the Ukrainians a little bit of time because they actually started to attack especially the logistic lines of the Russian side and the ammunition depots. And because of this, the Russians um, had to rearrange again. And this time was used by the Ukrainians to go in the counteroffensive. And this was actually the beginning phase of phase number three. And the counteroffensive was actually marked by Kharkiv, which was very clever done from the Ukrainian side, and Kherson. Kharkiv was more or less a surprise for the Russians <clears throat> because the Ukrainians attacked in a very clever way. They formed a small breakthrough 
And then uh, by using light forces attacked further interaction uh, east and surprised uh, and overwhelmed the Russians, which started to panic and to flee, while Kherson obviously was a deal in the background because it is very interesting to notice that about 30,000 Russian troops and 2,500 uh, vehicles were able to withdraw from the north part of the Tiempo River to the south part in a very short time frame. So this was pretty much phase number three. The, the next phase, phase number four, was when the Russians uh, realized that also what they did in the phase number two and phase number three will not lead to success, and they came up with a quite harsh decision, and the decision was to apply terror on Ukraine, and that was actually the starting point on the 10th of October, when they started to attack the critical infrastructure of Ukraine. And it's important to understand that the military distinguished between three key levels. This is the tactical level. This is what is happening in the trenches of Bakhmut, for example. It's the operational level. So this is what is happening when you look at the, uh, let's say, offensive in Haki for Kherson. And that's the strategic level. And the strategic level is very important because it decides if you are able or not to fight a long war. And the Russians still have the momentum on the strategic level because they can decide at what time and in what form they can attack the critical infrastructure of Ukraine. And that's what they did starting with the 10th of October. And on the 10th of February, just a couple of days ago, we had the 13th wave of attacks against the critical infrastructure of Ukraine. And that's quite difficult for the Ukrainians to fight against those attacks because they lack, for example, air defense. At the moment, the question is, will the next phase, the phase number five, um, in the near time actually happen? Will the, the starting point be a new offensive from the Russian side? Because at the moment, as you can see on the front line, you have pretty much a situation like limbo. So there is a stalemate between both sides. The Ukrainians still don't have the uh, forces to go into offensive again. The Russians try to gather forces because the biggest problem they had was the missing infantry from the beginning. But with the reservists, they are trying to fill their depleted ranks uh, in all these units and there might be a uh, full-scale uh, offensive in the near or the next future. I personally think they have already started doing it because also here the military distinguishes between different phases. So the first phase is the shaping phase, then there is the decisive phase, and then there is the enduring phase. And what we see at the moment is that the Russians started to come up with the shaping phase. So they try to probe by using little uh, units to attack along the whole front line to look out for weak spots and then try to exploit them. They failed until now. Um, in the south, uh, at uh, Ugledar, if you might have uh, heard of this, because there was a, twice uh, <clears throat> an attack from the Russian side, which was repelled by the, uh, by the Ukrainians. But it looks worse for the Ukrainians in Bakhmut, because Bakhmut obviously is close uh, to fall, because it's already encircled in the north and in the south. And this reminds us again of the situation in summer last year, of the cauldron battles of Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. So when the Russians will be able to, let's say, for example, occupy Bakhmut, then they will not only be in the second line of defense from the Ukrainian side, but they also will have another propaganda victory, which they will use, of course, to feed more or less their propaganda machinery. So the situation is, if you summarize, um, very grave one, because the Ukrainians still need a lot of assistance from the Western, um, from the Western side. We have a stalemate, we have a limbo situation at the moment. Both sides are still con convinced that they can win the war, and the next phase... Um, in the next months might be the decisive one when it comes, uh, when we look at the outcome of this uh, very uh, hor horrific war, actually. So the next month can be decisive despite yes. the fact that it's already a war of attrition or it's yes. going to become one? You have to understand that um, the Ukrainians were actually trained to conduct maneuver warfare. That's what they call maneuver warfare, to be high mobile, to use uh, small units. And as long as they are using those maneuver warfare, they are successful against the Russians. But what the Russians did is they tried to force the Ukrainians to fight the war of attrition. And this is where they have a lot of, uh, let's say, advantages against the Ukrainians. And that's what they do. Right. Uh, you mentioned already the West and the role of the West in this war, namely uh, supplying the weapons and uh, sustaining Ukraine militarily. And I'd like to turn to Hannes and ask, uh, ask you maybe on a political level how... How is the war seen in Europe? The war is happening now in Ukraine, but uh, Europe and the West has a big stake in this war. It's happening on the EU's border. It's affecting uh, EU member states already very strongly. So 
what were the mistakes the West has done in the past month? What were the uh, successes? Um, how do you assess this last period and wh where are we heading? Well, I think the military side and the political side are very much intertwined and, and connected. Um, for example, delivery of weapons. Is delivery, of, should it be done in a very strong way at once? You know, some people say you have to do everything now and not uh, wait first uh, to have the Leopard and then other tanks and then maybe uh, some fighters uh, to uh, support uh, the air fights. So I think it is very difficult to, to be on the right track. What is, you know, on the one hand, perhaps provoking Russia to go even more strongly and what, of course, on the other side, if you don't do enough, invites Russia to do even more and, and to be uh, uh, successful in their aggression towards uh, Ukraine. So overall, I think um, for many countries, especially for Germany, it was very difficult to act because for, for the past uh, decades, right. Germany said peace, negotiation, trade will uh, soften uh, Russian aggression and so on. Some others like the Polish and uh, the, the Baltic countries who had another experience, of course, uh, experience from the Soviet Union and who saw that the differences we underlined between Russia and the Soviet uh, is not so big. Maybe even Russia is even worse because what the Soviet Union did, they wanted to keep what they had, but what Russia wants to want to change and to go back into a, a, a previous uh, uh, territorial uh, situation. Um, so this is the big issue, and the second big issue, of course, is that we have uh, to think about the end of the war. Now, supporting uh, Ukraine, which is absolutely necessary, and I fully support uh, all the activities uh, the West has, has done, is one size thing. But if you see, as uh, you just said, you never know, Russia has been in a disadvantage, but for the moment it may be in an advantage position, then you have to think when should you go with the, come with initiatives to think about an armistice and perhaps in the long run also of a peace negotiation and a peace solution. Um, how can you do parallel? And this is the big way, uh, issue for the West. On the one hand, to support the Ukraine, on the other, and fully support the Ukraine, so that, as we always say, Ukraine is not losing, but Russia is losing. We don't speak about victory for Ukraine in the sense like uh, Mr. Zelensky is speaking himself. And on the other hand, of course, you have to think about that the end of the war, and you see more and more, even from the military, I don't know what's, what's your opinion, Marcus, but more and more also military uh, experts from, from the US and others say the, the end of the war must be a negotiated one because probably it will be very difficult to have a military one. I think that the Ukraine and some of the Western people have been too optimistic for some time when they thought, okay, we are already on the winning track. Things changed in the, in the last month. So I think that's, that's difficult. What we did wrong or not wrong, you cannot say now. You know, this famous word of, uh, I think it was Chu and Lai. Some people say it was Ho Chi Minh when he was asked about the uh, French Revolution. And they said, it's too early to judge. So... But I think what we have to underline is the support for Ukraine is absolutely necessary because we have to stop that Russian aggression. Where we have to stop it, where it is possible to stop it, I don't know. What I want to add as a last sentence, we have to know Russia changed dramatically in the past uh, years to the worse. And whatever will be the outcome of, of the war, there will be a very difficult, still probably revisionist, reactionary Russia we have to deal with. So the, the idea or the illusion some people had, we win the war and then Russia is totally different, is dissoluted, is uh, you know, separated. I doubt it will be still a very autocratic and very strange neighbor we will have to deal with. Let me maybe sure. um, add yeah. a little bit uh, to what you said. So first of all, I think we have to understand um, that, as you completely right pointed out, that there are two different approaches. The one is, let's say, to go for all in, you know, to give Ukraine all, this, all the equipment, all the weapons they need now, 
to fight this war against Russia. So this is the one approach. The other approach is a more careful one. This is more or less the European approach because a lot of people are saying, okay, poo, we have to be careful. We don't know what kind of an impact this will have. We might be involved in a, in a third world war. There is also an economical war fought between uh, Europe and, and Russia and so on and so on. Yeah? I would say we all agree also that the dominant uh, factor here is especially what the United States is doing. Yeah? So we have to have a look at the United States and what they are doing, actually. And when you look a little bit more in detail uh, at their actions, then you can see that they also try to go the careful way. Why? Because uh, there are certain indicators which show you very clearly that they don't want to escalate the conflict. Yeah? So ask yourself, for example, I told you before that the HIMARS system was so successful in summer, but they only delivered 20 the Ukrainians said we want to have 50 to 100. Yeah? And from a military perspective, 50 to 100 is a good number because this will have a decisive effect. Yeah? But the Americans just sent 20. Then the second thing is long-range weapons. Until now, the Americans refused to give them Atakams, which is a weapon with a range of 300 kilometers. They might will get the Ukrainians a weapon with a range of 160 kilometers, but still not this 300 kilometer range weapon. Same with uh, fighter, uh, fighter jets. Fighter jets yeah? There is a discussion, but Biden just recently said again, this is something we have to consider very carefully. Yeah? Then I told you about Kherson. How was it possible that 30,000 troops, Russian troops and uh, vehicles were able to withdraw on the other side? So the answer is that the Americans don't want to corner Russia. And this is very important because the big elephant in the room is nuclear weapons. Yeah? So the Americans try to make sure that the Russians are not cornered in a way that they start to do some irrational things. Yeah? And this is the big thing we have to consider always. The try, there is even a name for this strategy, to boil the frog. Yeah? Okay. So that means they try to, to wrangle the Russians while the Russians are wrangling the Ukrainians. So this is the, what they're actually doing at the moment. So they try always, if there is an asymmetric situation, like for example, if the Russians are on the winning then the Americans make sure that the Ukrainians will get enough to have a symmetric situation again. But they do not overpass or overshot because that might be then trigger some reaction from the Russian side, which we cannot control anymore. Huh? But this automatically means that this war will continue and there and this, cannot be a decisive right. victory. This is the big yeah. problem because that means that we will have no decisive effect on the battlefield right. triggered by a certain weapon system which can end the war. This is the problem. Right. Right. But isn't that, uh, because I just uh, read a, a study made by the Rand Corporation, isn't that also the danger that the longer the war is, the more is the, the chance that there will be an incident or the chance that at the end uh, it will involve NATO as such in, sure. in the war. So I think I agree fully with you, what you, what you said, and you are the expert anyway, but I think uh, it's not, um, of course, a long war means many, many, uh, you know, dead people, killed people, destroyed infrastructure, but it means also that the, the chance to have an incident which would lead to in stronger involvement and a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO will rise. No, you're completely right, because the quick question, is, the, the big question is, can you fight a controlled war? And the answer is no, because at a certain point something happens which triggers actions from the side which is affected, which you cannot control anymore. This is the problem. Yeah? And the thing is, when you look at military history, there's a certain term is called the hinge factor. So the hinge factor is a factor which decides uh, in a battle, for example, how the battle will end finally. You can, as a, let's say, leader of troops, um, define, okay, this is the situation now which I have to exploit and then I will win the battle or not. But this can also lead to a point where the other side is doing things which you maybe have not in mind at, in the second you're actually coming up with your decision. This is the problem here, because it might be that a regional war will become a war which is not only reduced to a certain region, like between Russia and Ukraine, but will be fought globally, for example, when it comes to trade rules, when it comes to cyber warfare. You might have feared that obviously there was a cyber attack on the weekend on, on NATO systems and things like that. And this is the big danger we have here. And the longer the war takes, the bigger is uh, the bad uh, chance that uh, you have an incident which then out of the sudden will completely escalate. And this is the problem. All right. Let me ask you also about the manpower. So Russia has one uh, resource that Ukraine doesn't have if 
it's not supported by the West, and for now the West is not going to support Ukraine in this way, and that's that's additional soldiers. So uh, Russia has announced partial mobilization in uh, in September, if I yeah. remember correctly. They recruited 3,000, uh, 300,000 uh, soldiers. Uh, they already deployed, I think, half of them. And so, uh, and Ukraine, uh, according to some reports, is deploying or is uh, drafting now people who are over 60 years of age. So some someday this human resource will end there, and it will be much faster than it will end, than it will end in Russia. So what does it mean for Ukraine? What does it mean for the West if it still says that it's supporting this country? Absolutely, that you, you you are at absolutely at the core of the problem. And when you consider what we just have discussed before, then you can actually can see that Ukraine has no interest in a long war because it has limited human resources. Because you have a 35 million people country, when you, let's say, try just to, to focus on the people which are still in Ukraine and not the ones who flee from the country, so 35 million people fighting against 145 million people in Russia. Yeah? And Russia has, of course, more human resources than Ukraine because at the moment... The West is fighting in Ukraine till the last Ukrainians. This is the awful truth. This is the problem. So the Ukrainians have an interest that this war will end soon. And this is why they insist that they have to have all the equipment they need to come up with a short uh, and, uh, let's say, sufficient solution to end this war. And as you completely right uh, pointed out at the moment, the problem is you have already the eighth or ninth wave of mobilization in Ukraine ongoing, up to 60, some even say over 60, and this is a huge burden. If you look at the, the videos from the uh, Ukrainian POWs, uh, prisoners of war, in uh, the eastern part of the country, then you can see that nearly every second or third uh, is an old man, more or less, and this gives you an impression that there is a very tense situation. While on the other side, you still have the Russians coming in because they started the mobilizations, but it never ended. Yeah? They, 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 that's what they just tell you, and by using their propaganda to their people, but no one can control how much uh, or how many people they actually call uh, to the weapons. Yeah, and this is what you see. Mobilizing and the there were some problems in the beginning. Yeah. Soldiers were drunk and they had the rust equipment. But this is under control at the moment and they're coming to the front. Mm -hmm. And this is the big problem <clears throat> because the longer it takes for the Ukrainians to go back into the offensive, the more is the advantage on the Russian side because the key factor is time. Exactly. So then the obvious questions come, question come, comes up, what are the options? Where, where are the peace negotiations? Where are the ceasefire agreements that we all need so desperately? And I suppose Russia also does. I don't know, maybe, maybe Marcus, uh, Hannes, you, you see differently, but I guess they are also not interested in prolonging this war. So, Hannes, what do you say? Well, well, just uh, Marco said, of course, uh, Ukraine has the biggest interest as such to, to have a short war and to... to uh, and it soon, of course, with all the promises of uh, Zelensky that he will get back everything, the Donbas area and uh, the Crimea, it's a bit difficult for him now to end it because there were too many promises, perhaps, or too many expectations raised with the, with the people. But maybe the people themselves will say, okay, whatever, now we have to stop the war as soon as possible. Russia has some interest, not as strong because it has some more reserves, but of course Putin, in, I think, has two interests. First of all, Putin never knows when maybe the, the, the opposition of the people or the despair or is, is too big. And secondly, of course, he brought in uh, forces like uh, Pigozhin, who from, from the Wagner Group, who is now you know, competing with the military. And the big danger for him is the even more radical people like Pegosian and not uh, the military as such. So he has some interest. If there has, he can deliver in some way some victory or some success, whatever success is. Um, there are people who say the U.S. has the least interest because they're far away. They have still some, uh, you know, can try uh, and see how the weapons are functioning. Of course, there are some moderate people who think about the possible incidents we spoke about. I recently wrote a contribution by an, an, an expert uh, on international law, and he said, well, the UN should come in. Of course, the UN Security Council is blocked, but uh, the, the UN has a system where it says if the Security Council cannot come to a decision because it's blocked, obviously, by the veto of Russia, the General Assembly can do something. And I think um, 
I would like also the UN Secretary General to, together with the General Assembly who passed quite uh, correct uh, resolution in the majority would come in and try to see, first of all, what is really happening. For example, what kind of crimes are committed. Of course, they have to look to both sides to be objective, to the Russian side, the Ukrainian side. And then, of course, they could start some deliberations, how a peace agreement or agreement about uh, truce and amnesties could be found. Also, um, I don't think it is much use for the West to criticize India or uh, South uh, Africa or Brasilia that they are not condemning Russia enough. Maybe that these so-called neutral countries from the BRICS uh, family, from the family of these uh, big countries, they could take initiative uh, in saying, well, it's not our interest that the war is going on because of uh, the food uh, uh, problem or the energy problem because we have other issues like climate change which has to be dealt by all the countries. So I think there are possibilities if the West would also be interested in giving clear signals to these big uh, powers, do something, go for some initiative, do some pressure also on Russia to to be ready for some sort of negotiations. Because if Russia says, we're ready for negotiations with our preconditions, but, but Ukraine has to accept the reality, our boots on the ground, that's of course not without preconditions. So I think it is time, and there are some people who are at least try to find ways how it could be done that uh, from the outside, there is some pressure on both sides, but of course it must be especially on Russia, to try to find a way out. Now we can discuss what could be the way out. What's about the Crimea? Is it really useful to change Crimea again into, um, into the Ukraine? What does it mean? Is it not another foreign occupation of, of Crimea because uh, of the people who are living now there? So these are the details, but I think yeah, it would be very necessary to take some initiatives. Well, it's a, it's a very contested topic at the moment. And as you can imagine, there are two camps. So the one camp is saying, okay, well, let's go for confrontation. Always referring also to the situation at Munich 1938, uh, because they say, well, it's the same situation like it was in the 30s uh, of the last century. And the other side, the other camp is saying, oh, okay, we have to start to come up with diplomacy and things like that, negotiations. While the other camp is well saying, well, the Russians don't want to negotiate and things like that. So the, the problem is you can't have a clear answer on that at the moment. Yeah. And the fight will go on as long as both sides are still convinced that they can win yeah. the war. And this is the important thing, because a war of attrition ends at the moment either one side is accepting that they will lose, uh, or let's say one side is actually losing all the assistance from a third party or even from the people uh, which are more or less the ones who have to fight uh, this war and to have to, to share this burden. So as long as both sides are still think they can win the war, the, the war will go on. But as we all know, a state, if a state wants to apply power, he has four possibilities. So the first is the military, something which was used in the 19th century, which we thought will never happen in the 20th or 21st century. Second one is economy, which is also a very big thing for a state uh, by using, for example, soft power tools to apply power to a certain region, whatever it is. Yeah? Then you have diplomacy, which is very important and is something which we... I forget a little bit today, I think, because it's always diplomacy who, in the, especially in the background, tries to sense a little bit how is the situation at the moment. And the fourth thing, which is very important, is situation and awareness. You have to have a clear, neutral, bipartisan assessment of the situation. And that's what we are at the moment lacking a little bit, because I compare this always a little bit with the history. I think that we are coming from the year 1914, have reached the year 1915. And the year 1915 was the year where everyone realized that all the things we have sought in 1914 will not happen and that we have to come up with mobilization things like, uh, let's say, weapon production and so on and so on. And as we all know, in the First World War, in 1916 already, the first, uh, let's say, initiatives in the back started to negotiate somehow. And it took another two years till 1918, till the war ended. And as we all know, the, the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy pretty much fall victim to the attrition war at that time already. So I don't want to give an answer what camp is right, but I would stress, and I think you would all agree, 
that at any time we should try, as, at least in the background, to sense how is the situation, how is the situation, to make sure that we not overpass a situation where there might have been the situation that we can actually start to bring the people on the table and so on and so on. Yeah? Because you have to come up with something for both sides. Because at the moment, Russian, Russia is in a room with only one door. Yeah? So there is no, let's say, exit for them. Because they, they've created on their own that they are again a global power, that they have powerful military forces and things like that. And they cannot just say, well, okay, this was a mistake, we will stop here. So you have to give them something or you have to show them a way out of this room. Well, the same applies for the Ukrainians. Yeah? Because the Ukrainians cannot just say, okay, we will more or less um, stop where we are. Yeah? And you cannot tell them, okay, you just forget Crimea because from the Ukrainian perspective, this is also a very important part of the country. Yeah? And you might also should not use certain terms like peace agreement, yeah? Maybe we should just start with armistice. Yeah? So, so something like, okay, let's stop fighting at the moment. Yeah? Everyone can claim that he is the winner and he wants to have that, but let's just talk a little bit. Yeah? And then maybe afterwards you can go on fighting, but let's just have a talk. Yeah? And unfortunately, <clears throat> when you look into history, then you see that things like we see today um, happened all the time because there are a lot of similarities to conflicts in the, in the history. problem is that we all have forgotten them because there is no real historical knowledge around. And I would say one example for the movement uh, could be that something happens like it was in North and South Korea in the 1950s, that at a certain point, yeah, when both sides agreed, okay, we have reached something, uh, we have to sit down again. And as you know, still today, it is uh, an armistice. There is no peace agreement, but at least the, the, the fighting has stopped. So this is something I think we should come up because the longer the war takes, the more devastation it will mean for Ukraine, for the people there. Uh, just think of <clears throat> these millions of artillery shells which were used in the East or these millions of mines which were used there where normally the grain is growing. So this is a very, very um, difficult situation. That's why I think uh, it is nonsense <coughs> to ask for stopping the... Uh, to send equipment to Ukraine because uh, it does not mean that Russia will say, okay, now uh, uh, the Ukrainians will not have enough weapons, now we stop the war. They would even continue it even more. <clears throat> so I think we have to go parallel to send the weapons on, on the one hand, but on the other hand to sense what kind <clears throat> of possibilities here. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, Korea. It's not the same, and you are a much more the military expert, but when you think about Korea, there was a discussion by MacArthur brought in not to use nuclear weapons yeah. in order to stop the Chinese to support the North Korea. Curtis Lee May was yeah. the general who actually came up with the idea yeah, to yeah. use uh, atomic, the atomic bomb. The bomb. And yes, but finally, the American president who said, well, well you yeah, know, yeah. do this. And yeah. finally, MacArthur even had, had to go uh, yeah. to leave uh, his com commanding uh, position. So... Even at that time, the nuclear issue played already a role, of course, because of the bombs uh, thrown on, on, on Japan in, in some, some time ago. So, uh, again, the nuclear issue plays some role. It's not that we have to, uh, to accept to be blackmailed by Russia. Some of the people in Poland or in, or in the Baltic say, yeah, you're, you're too, too nervous and too who are afraid of Russia and that it's just a blackmail. Yes, it's a blackmail, but on the other hand, it's also a possibility. So I think uh, we have to go parallel, unfortunately, to continue the war on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, to try to find possibilities and to ask people who have a neutral position in some way and who have big enough influence to look and to support any kind of movement which is going in direction of an armistice, just to stop the fighting. All the rest has to be done for many years afterwards. Let me just stress one important thing, because this is also something a lot of people are discussing and thinking this is the solution. Stopping delivering weapons to Ukraine. Yeah? A lot of people think that if we stop delivering weapons to Ukraine, the whole thing will just end. This is not true. Right. What will happen? The Russians will think, yeah. well, now we are on the winning course, side and they will just go on doing what they do and they will destroy Ukraine. This will be the outcome if you stop of delivering course. weapons. I know it's a, it's a very harsh and paradox situation saying that uh, stopping, uh, not stopping delivering weapons will not end the war, but it is the awful truth. So Russia has to understand that it cannot win. Uh, yeah. 
Only when Russia understands that it cannot win, it will be able, or let's say it will be willing yeah, to go to the negotiation table. If we just stop uh, assisting Ukraine on the one side, they will just go on because they Do think, you think we they will win. Do you think they would go beyond Ukraine? Say again? Do you think that they would go beyond re- Ukraine? No, uh, not for the Pacific. moment, because the Russian army still at the moment is not the Soviet army. So there is a big difference. So there is no, there should be no fear that the first guards tank army will conquer uh, Europe and uh, march to Berlin. So this will not happen because there, there is a lot which is still missing. So we have to wait another 20 to 30 years and maybe with the same power and the assistance of China, Russia will be able to come up with these kind of forces. But there but is Moldova, no need. Moldova, yeah. for example, could, could be. be you know. But there is no need because uh, what they do is actually they are not only fighting, let's say, with weapons in Ukraine, but, but there is also an economical war. So there are a lot of things they can do on the other side. And there is the term of hybrid warfare, which is actually an expression for things which can happen in the, in the back, let's say, cyber attacks, um, attacks on the critical infrastructure and so on. So there is no need to send a Russian soldier to Berlin. Uh, there, there are other uh, ways, yeah? Uh, and just to think of the info, information domain, so the influence operations from the Russians, especially in Europe, which leads to the point that the people are hesitating and saying, well, what should we do, and so on and so on. Uh, mm-hmm. But one is clear, if, if we stop to supply Ukraine with weapons, then of course Russia will do what they actually intended to do, and this will be the destruction of Ukraine. And Putin was very clear here, because... Prior to the invasion, in a very long statement, full of historical examples, he said very clear that Ukraine is not a state which has the right to exist as a state. And this has not changed until today. No. If Ukraine stops the war, it will be destroyed. If Russia stops the war, Ukraine will have at least a chance to survive as a state. Right. Let me maybe ask you one more question, uh, coming back to possible um ways out or uh, some opportunities. Uh, you mentioned the military fighting, you mentioned diplomacy. Uh, I'd like to cite Ivan Krastev, who said recently that uh, wars don't end in diplomacy or peace agreements in our days, but they end in elections. And there are three important elections next year, which is in the United States, in Russia, and in Ukraine. And the elections in Ukraine and in Russia are happening basically at the same time. What does it mean for us? What will uh, happen during this year before those elections come? Because even in Russia, where the elections uh, are just a formality, they still mean something. So apparently the leaders are going to get prepared for that. They're going to prepare the populations. They're going to use the, uh, I don't know, successes or failures on the ground in Ukraine um, for their advantage. So how do you see that playing well, into If I may, if I start, so let's first of all start with the Russians. So if the Russian propaganda still works like it works at the moment, then Putin will be re-elected. So this is, I think, very clear. So nothing will change. There might be some kind of a black swan moment or some kind of revolution 1917, but we don't see it at the moment. So very likely the people who are still not very much affected by the war, we have to say, because the ones in Moscow and St. Petersburg, they don't uh, let's say, suffer a lot from what is happening actually in Ukraine. And even the, the soldiers who die um, very often from, from poor families in behind the wall. Yeah. So, so the outcome will be that Putin again, uh, maybe not with the highest number, but again will be the, the president. On the other side, in Ukraine, if Zelensky manages to, let's say, lead the country through the war in a way that the people are not affected too harsh, uh, especially when we look at the attacks on the critical infrastructure, for example. Uh, so if he managed... Uh, to make sure that the people still can somehow live in the country, also he will be elected again. So there will be no real change on these both sides. Uh, so the decisive election will be in the United States, because in the United States, there will be the decision, how will the US go on with this war? In a way that they assist Ukraine, and it's already at the moment that the uh, American assistance is the decisive assistance, it's not the European one, it's the American one, or will they decide, for example, okay, so this is not our problem anymore, this is a European problem, we just try to do what we already said a couple of years ago, we will now focus on the Pacific and on China. Yeah? So I would say that the elections in America are the, the, the decisive ones, actually. Well, I fully agree uh, with Putin. Maybe there will be less participation by citizens uh, to go to the, to the vote, but uh, he will be elected. In Ukraine, um, I think no political force can say, well, uh, our agenda is to stop the war. I think no, nobody can do it. 
there will be some criticism mm -hmm. about uh, Zelensky and the way he, he you know, manages to present himself, but it will not dramatically change. Uh, the US, uh, yeah, if Trump is elected, things may change. And in Europe, you, you didn't mention the European election, which All are, right. of course, uh, of not course. so important, but, but uh, can be a um, symbol of, um, of a change in the mood of people. You know, we already were afraid that in Italy it will change the mood. Until now, not. Meloni is quite on, on the same track. But of course, if in Austria, in other countries, more and more uh, the right wing, uh, which is a mixture of uh, pro-Russian, anti-vaccine and whatever uh, solution will win, it could change the attitude in Europe. And that, of course, together with the US change, in the direction of the, of the Republicans and, and tr Trump Republicans, mm -hmm. this of course could have an impact of it, and maybe maybe even Putin is waiting for these elections in order to to get some support for his position indirectly from these elections. But uh, therefore, it would be good if the war could be stopped before, uh, also to save a lot of human lives. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can end this discussion here. Maybe, maybe one more question I would like to ask, uh, Marcus. Well, and I have a, yeah. a last, a, a final message, sure. which I think is also yeah. very important. Yeah, please, but just go on. Yeah, the question was, uh, where, uh, what shall we look for? Where shall we look at in the next months? What, what is, what are your predictions? What are your uh, so. Military-wise, yeah. uh, it would be interesting to look in, in detail what kind of weapons the Ukraine will get in the next months to come. Yeah? Will they get these long-range weapons? Will they get their fighter jets? Will they even get submarines like they actually were asking for? So this will be interesting because the weapons they will get will affect the way they will be able to fight the war. Yeah? If there will be long-range weapons, then this will have an impact on the Russian side for sure. Yeah? On the other side... Uh, you always have to look a little bit in detail what is happening on the Russian side. So we still have, because as a result of this information warfare from the beginning, the idea that the Russians are completely incompetent what they are doing. This is not true. Uh, we have to start to take them serious because uh, there is a lot of success also on the Russian side. Yeah? You might remember there was this incident uh, where this um, school, which was uh, full of soldiers, were bombarded in, uh, on, on Sylvester, in the Sylvester night. Makivka was the name, yeah? And a lot of people were saying, okay, look at uh, the Russians, um, what they did. Actually, they, they stuffed all the soldiers in this single uh, building and it was destroyed. But the question is, why was there only one Makivka? Why weren't there many of those uh, buildings destroyed? Because you can see that the Russians are adapting. And this is the point, yeah? also at the moment. Don't be fooled by certain pictures which show you that they are completely incompetent because there's a lot of going on behind the scenes. Yeah? We don't have to, under, to forget that we are also part of an information warfare. So I think I would uh, look for these weapons from the Ukrainian side, what they get, and also what the Russians are doing in the next weeks and months to come. And also when it comes to the offensive, they can start an offensive, but they must not, because they just can go on doing what they do to fight the war of attrition against the Ukrainian side. And the last thing is a little bit of a message, yeah, because we have talked a lot about the U.S., Russia, Ukraine, but we haven't talked a lot about Europe, yeah, and also about China, for example, or India, so my message would be for the European people, we have to start to emancipate ourselves in a way. If we want to make sure that this project of the European Union will be a successful project also for the next years to come, then we have to start seriously to consider especially our security as something which we have to take care of yeah? and not just give it to the Americans to do so and not uh, avoiding that we, let's say, are a power which are also some kind of a threatening power against others, like, for example, Russia or China. So this is something I really would like to stress. Strategic autonomy. Abso 2 absolutely, yeah. To, 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 to quote yeah. the very famous guy, actually. Right. Here. Right. And to <laughs> add, to, we should always remember that Austria must be an integral part of that Europe. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely correct. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.